Tell you about Patty Coleman up in Boston. He was a gambler. First, I want to put this in perspective for you. At that time, we're talking about just the turn of the 20th century, up until, well, he died in the 40s, but up until the, the Irish had taken over the structure, the political structure of Boston. The Wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, if you like, or Yankees, we call them, but non-Irish people, control the rest of the state, for that matter, most of New England. But the Irish had wrestled away key components of running Boston, the mayorship, uh, police departments, Democratic Party, which was essential then. It's essential now in Boston. So what I'm going to tell you, but you have to look at it in that perspective, that they kept cut the WASP guys, who were right, they were right. These guys, I'm an Irish American, I'm proud of it, but you know, frankly, a lot of these guys, my God, they were blatant thieves, they were horrible people. Uh, but anyway, they were horrible people, and the WASP were almost always in the right, coming after them, trying to put them in jail. And the Irish being the Irish, they managed to change it around that they were being persecuted. And a lot of people bought into that, too. And they weren't being persecuted, just that the one guy would get elected and he'd help his pal up the chain and so forth. So when you went after them individually, it, they were all Irish. And that's how it looked, as though they were prosecuted, persecuting the Irish. They weren't. They were prosecuting. And in many cases, I have to tell you, as much as I love these people, you know, they had it coming to him. So bear that in mind when I go over this with you. So Patty Coleman, uh, he ran gambling, huge parts of gambling uh, in Boston in the 30s and 40s. Uh, he ran Southeast, South Boston, Roxbury, and Back Bay. Coleman entered the trade in 1913, uh, but he had never been arrested, nor had he ever in all those years until the mid-40s. He'd never arrested, and he never had his operation shut down. One time there was a police raid through a lot of hocus pocus. The police had to return the money they took from him. It's remarkable. He was born in County Sligo, Ireland. He came to Boston in 17 with his brothers Michael and Martin. Uh, together they built up uh, and they ran Coleman and Keating Company. It was a soft drink bottling company with some <laughs> questionable background during Prohibition, but it was a bottling company. And they put out soda. Coleman was also president of the South and Dem South Boston, in other words, Democratic Club, and he was politically very, very powerful. Um, there, it, it was a powerhouse to control that part of the city, and he controlled it for decades. He was very prominent with the Irish there because, he, among other things, he had these free Thanksgiving parties for the South End. Anybody can come up and he'd feed you, and he gave a huge Fourth of July festivals open to, as they say there, all the voting public. Coleman was the reason he got away with it. He operated really in the open. It was only secret, and the cops were never coming after him. And a large part of this because his business partner in the gambling business was Nako McCormick. Nako McCormick was the brother of John McCormick, who had been lawyer for the Gustin gang, another but a violent uh, Irish gang. Um, <laughs> so... Corman, McCormick, of course, became Speaker of the House of the United States of America later on. Uh, Nako McCormick was a real character, and he, uh, when he died, virtually the whole city, two U.S. senators turned out for his funeral and so forth. Uh, he managed, so even though he ran gambling, he somehow managed to convince people that he had lost all his money gambling. I sincerely doubt he ever gambled. I think he ran a lot of gambling. Coleman's operation with McCormick was enormous. He employed hundreds of runners, clerks, gophers. He bribed a lot of cops. Um, there is a legend that he played, paid one police captain $100,000. I don't know if that's true. $100,000 in the 30s and 40s seems to have been more than any one guy would be worth. But eventually this brazenness, it, it, running his operation out in the open, better citizens and demanded a cleanup and by the governor. And the governor, of course, was James Michael Curley. He's another Irish-American guy who came from South Boston. So Curley said, you're right, of course, this is an outrage. And he fired the police commissioner for not doing enough. And he brought in some guy who had an advertising background and was a big contributor. And he lasted about a year and a half they fired him. So realizing he had to do something, Curley brought in James Francis Tamelty. 
T I M I L T Y, Timelty. And Timelty was <laughs> incredibly corrupt, but he held, he held the post for seven years. He was corrupt in the sense that he, he was a gambler and ran gambling, which I know you shouldn't do if you're the police commissioner. But his immigrant father owned one of Boston's most successful construction companies. And that construction company, when Curley became mayor, uh, ended up with three million. This is nineteen thirty something. Three million dollars in road contracts from Mayor Curley's office. Eventually, Timothy, he's now the police commissioner, was indicted for conspiracy uh, for, to monopolize road paving in the industry in the city. But uh, Boston, being Boston, the case disappeared. When Curley took over the governor's mansion, he brought Timothy with him. As his military aide, you're entitled to a military aide. This guy had no military experience, but it was a cool job. He got to wear a general's uniform, and he had a sword and a cape and the whole thing. So he's looking, or Curly's looking around to do something to put somebody in the police commissioner's job. So he appoints Tumalti to the job, and he served 36 to 43. In his first year in the job, Tumalti ordered the arrest of a, a lot of small-time bookies but he left Coleman alone, and it turned out later on that these bookies he had locked up were <laughs> competitors for Coleman and Nako McCormick. So on March 27, 1943, rather, so Tumalti and six of his guys um, in office, in the police commission office, were indicted for, of all things, uh, uh, conspiracy to permit the operation of a gambling house and registration of bets. What led to that was he was indicted by this wasp jury they ran this investigation because he couldn't explain where he got $37,000 that he had been holding they found out in a safe deposit box he just said he didn't know it, it was a miracle how it got there he had no idea it was a, a miracle to him the indictment was quashed of course on June the 5th Tumulty returned to his job he was re-indicted by the wasp end of things he was re-indicted I shouldn't say by wasp on June 25th a few weeks later Frank Donahue who was one of Tumalte's school chums when they were kids, he quashed the second indictment. So Governor Saltstone, the epitome of a Yankee, um, New England Yankee, just said that's it. He became governor and he did not reappoint Tumalte. In 1951, Tumalte ran for mayor of Boston, more as a fluke than anything else, and uh, he didn't get out of the primaries. He finished third. Patty Coleman died in 1944 at the age of 71. He took bets up until a week before he died. 